Okay, hello everyone, and welcome to Grand Rounds. My name is Dr. Gabriel Cisneros. I'm a pediatrician with Children's Community Pediatrics, and I'm one of the founding members of a group called Clinicians for Climate Action. And I have the pleasure of introducing today's speaker. If after his presentation, you're interested in learning more about the work that we're doing to decarbonize our healthcare system here in, um, at UPMC and, and beyond, um, please uh, uh, talk with me afterwards. Thank you. So we are honored to have Dr. Aaron Bernstein speak with us on environmental sustainability today. As a reminder for those attending virtually, questions can be posted in the Q&A throughout the lecture, and you can join us for a more formal, informal meet and greet at the end of the presentation by asking the host to unmute you. The CME and MOC2 codes will be posted in the chat and displayed in the back of Rango's. Aaron Bernstein is the interim director of the Center for Climate, Health, and the Global Environment at Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health, also known as Harvard Chan Sea Change. A pediatrician at Boston Children's Hospital and an associate, assistant professor of pediatrics at Harvard Medical School. Dr. Bernstein focuses on the health impacts of the climate crisis on children's health and advancing solutions to address its causes to improve the health and well being of children around the world. Dr. Bernstein is an author on the Human Health Chapter of the Fifth National Climate Assessment, a congressionally mandated report that evaluates the impacts of climate change on humans and natural systems in the United States, led by the US Global Change Research Program. He regularly testifies before Congress on the child health impacts of climate change, drawing from his personal experience as a pediatrician having to treat children with breathing difficulties, vector-borne diseases, and trauma from natural disasters. Dr. Bernstein leads Climate MD, a Harvard Chan Sea Change program to encourage physicians to transform climate change from an issue dominated by politics and concerns about the future or faraway places to one that matters to every person's health here and now. He is the course director for human health and global environmental change and created the Harvard X course, The Health Effects of Climate Change, which explores how climate change influences health through its effects on air quality, nutrition, infectious diseases, and human migration, as well as solutions to the climate crisis. Dr. Bernstein serves as chair of the American Academy of Pediatrics Council on Environmental Health and Climate Change. He serves on the external advisory board of the Dalio Center for Health Justice at New York Presbyterian Hospital, is chair of the board of directors at the US Green Building Council, and is on the board of advisors at Parents Magazine as an environmental health specialist. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Aaron Bernstein. Thanks so much, Dr. Cisneros. And I'm very grateful for the opportunity to be with you virtually. Um, I do know Pittsburgh a bit um, from past travels and um, I'm really uh, honored to be able to speak to colleagues um, and talk about why climate change matters to our day jobs. Um, my goal uh, in this session will be to give you a little bit about how climate change matters to child health, but more importantly, how climate change matters to our ability to do our jobs uh, and perhaps most importantly, why our roles as child health providers are actually incredibly important uh, in work to address the challenges of climate change uh, and to help push climate actions forward. Uh, so with that, I will pull up some slides. I hope you all can see these. Uh, to start with, I have no disclosures to make. Um, I reviewed these three learning objectives and those comments I just made. Uh, and I just wanna take one minute to talk about the reality of climate change. Um, and uh, this is a graph that shows the average temperature on Earth uh, going back to the late 19th century. We have temperature records, of course, going back hundreds of thousands, in some cases, millions of years. Uh, but there've been enough thermometers uh, on enough places on Earth to get a sense of the global average temperature going back this far. 
And you don't need to be a climate scientist uh, to see a warming trend here. Um, fortunately for, for this audience, um, I don't have to explain what an FUO is, um, but for many years, uh, not any years in the recent past, that should be clear, uh, there was a question as to whether this warming was a fever of unknown origin. And to be very clear, um, this is uh, not a fever of unknown origin. Uh, this is very much a fever of known origin uh, that relates to the emissions of greenhouse gases. Uh, the, the fact that greenhouse gases warm our planet is completely scientifically boring. Uh, it's been known since the late 19th century that greenhouse gases were the reason that the planet was habitable, that in fact, the, the temperature of Earth would be so cold as to be uh, a planet where life would be very much different than it is today. Uh, if it weren't for greenhouse gases, and there were scientists in the 19th century as coal was being combusted, who predicted the warming we're seeing today. So talking more about the reality of greenhouse gases warming the planet uh, would be akin to me trying to spend more time trying to convince you that, you know, germs cause disease, which is to say neither of those would be a particularly good use of our time. Now, I'm hoping to leave plenty of time for questions, and if any of you have questions about climate science or how we understand warming is happening, I'm, I'm very happy to take those. But now let's dig into the reality of what climate change means to health and particularly the health of children. Uh, and I wanna do that through a series of, of cases, um, all of which are, are, are adapted from, from real ones uh, that have crossed my path. So uh, the first is a story of, a, of an urgent care shift in February, 2018, where you're caring for a four month old uh, and the four-month-old has gastro, is dehydrated. Um, and the question I want to pose to you is, what do you want to do for this infant? So um, please feel free to throw in some, I don't know if you all have access virtually to the chat or those in the room might be able to raise their hand, uh, but please throw in your ideas uh, and uh, we'll see if you guys are able to get, get what, what the right management plan is here. By the way, the, the questions start off easy. So I see 95 people virtually, and I can't imagine that none of those individuals has a thought about what to do for this child if people in the room are also maybe not able to get to a mic. All right, I guess it's the Q&A feature, so. Can you hear me? We would like to give them some fluids. So I'm not sure I'm going to pronounce uh, this name right, uh, correctly, but it's uh, Tanya uh, said, send some labs, right? So see how dehydrated this infant is. Good. What do you want to do otherwise about the dehydration? We would like oh. to give them some fluids. <laughs> right. Excellent. Good fluids. Right. So that's, that's, that's a good, good first start. So that's what I wanted to do. Um, and I wrote an order for IV fluids and was told very quickly by our um, order entry system that that wasn't gonna be happening. And I thought that was surprising because I've been doing this for a while at this point and I have never been told that we weren't allowed to give IV fluids. Um, but in fact, uh, we were rationing IV fluids. And the reason we were rationing IV fluids was this. Uh, this is Hurricane Maria. Uh, it made landfall over Puerto Rico in the fall, September of 2017. You'll remember this case took place in February, 2018. Um, many of you will know that Hurricane Maria um, devastated the island. Thousands of people died, uh, and there were protracted um, scarcities of all kinds of critical resources, water, food, electricity. Uh, what many may not be as aware of is what it did to the manufacturing on the island. Uh, Puerto Rico is home to a large base of biopharmaceutical manufacture, and this storm uh, went right over our, uh, the province of Haihuya, which I've always mispronounced. My Puerto Rican uh, colleagues always um, try and correct me, and I must completely chagrin that I still don't think I pronounced it correctly. Where in this, um, uh, there was the main uh, manufacturing facility for small volume IV fluid bags, uh, ones we typically use to push or to put uh, meds, IV meds on a pump. Uh, Interestingly, this loss of capacity uh, created a domino effect. It was a bad flu season. Uh, one of the major suppliers of saline uh, was out of commission at this time. And it was this event that sort of tipped the system over and we wound up having 
national shortages of IV fluids. Um, I have yet to meet any uh, anyone who is working at this time who's working in a hospital where IV fluids were not being rationed uh, in the United States. Uh, there were articles in the newspaper about this. Uh, there were even articles published in the New England Journal uh, which described triage protocols about whether a person was close enough to death to warrant the use of IV fluids. Um, and, and this storm uh, illustrates so much about what's at risk with climate change uh, through supply chains um, and the potential of climate shocks, as I like to call them, to create problems for healthcare far away from where they may occur. Uh, to be clear, the effects of warming on hurricanes are well understood. Uh, ocean heat is hurricane food. The warmer the oceans get, the more energy hurricanes have. We've already seen a trend towards more intense hurricanes. Uh, and uh, these hurricanes are uh, making landfall and stalling. Uh, that's one thing that probably contributed to the five feet of rain that Hurricane Harvey put over Houston. Um, they're also going from zero to 60 faster. They're accelerating faster, which makes it harder to, to judge preparedness well. Um, and critically, they're getting less frequent. So um, there's often confusion on this point, which is hurricanes are expected to get less frequent, but the ones that happen will be more severe. Now, yes, I hear you cry. You are in Pittsburgh and you don't think about hurricanes. Um, and uh, uh, I'm here to tell you that you actually start need to thinking, uh, you, start, you will need to start thinking about hurricanes. When you look nationally at risks uh, from extremes uh, made more uh, challenging by climate change, uh, you can see that there's differences, uh, you know, uh, in the West, drought is certainly an issue and wildfires are an issue. On the Gulf and Atlantic coast, hurricanes are an issue. But one of the changes with hurricanes uh, that has been apparent is that they are moving up the coast of, uh, up the Atlantic coast. Um, <clears throat> there were uh, floods uh, just uh, last month uh, in Pittsburgh, around Pittsburgh, I should say in southwestern Pennsylvania, as remnants of Hurricane Nicole dumped uh, uh, record levels of rain uh, over your region. Uh, and there's been a very clear trend since the 19th century of hurricanes moving further up the coast, as is illustrated from this graphic from paper and scientific reports from a few years ago. Uh, that's not terribly surprising, right, folks, because ocean warming is happening, in fact, at rates greater than air warming. Uh, you talk to anyone who used to fit, uh, go uh, uh, search for lobsters around where I live in Boston, uh, the lobsters aren't really here anymore. They've moved north. Uh, the warming water uh, is, a again, where hurricanes get uh, their food from. So the, fat, the prospects of flooding uh, are real uh, for places like Pittsburgh from hurricane remnants moving up the Atlantic coast. But on top of that, you may have noticed in the prior slide that the current greatest risk of climate uh, on uh, you know, extreme events in Pittsburgh is heavy rainfalls. And there's certainly been lots of floods from heavy rainfalls already. Uh, if you look at the nation as a whole, um, you can see that there's been a dramatic increase in extreme precipitation events. Um, these are events at the top, you know, one to sometimes 5% of precipitation over the past century plus. Um, the region with the greatest increase in these heavy downpours is the Northeast region. Um, and you can see the projected changes in overall rainfall are real. So, you know, somewhere on the order of 20, maybe 30% uh, for Southwestern Pennsylvania. Uh, but the bigger signal is that when it does rain, it pours. So some of you may know the Morton Salt uh, slogan, which is when it rains, it pours. And that is um, the reality of the climate we're living in. So heavy downpours, uh, as well as increased hurricane intensity, uh, make this issue of flooding uh, a real issue. Now, besides from the effects of um, consequences of things like hurricanes disrupting supply chains, uh, they can cause power outages. Uh, this is what uh, the southern tip of Manhattan looked like in the wake of Hurricane Sandy. It left 8 million people without power. And folks, if uh, the southern tip of Manhattan can lose its power, where arguably the greatest concentration of wealth exists in the world, uh, it can go out anywhere. Uh, and we have seen a trend towards more power outages uh, in the United States as a consequence of extremes, including uh, heavy downpours and hurricanes, but also heat waves, uh, as well as wildfires. So 
uh, the first case here is really to underscore that these extremes, these climate shocks, very much matter to our ability to deliver care, uh, whether that's through supply chain shortages, power outages, and for any of you who've had to deal with flooding, you know it can be hard to get to or from <laughs> any place in particular, including work or home, uh, when there's flooding. And then, of course, our, our patients may have difficulty accessing care. So that's the first case. Um, I'm going to move into a second case now. Uh, this is a 16-year-old who uh, presents with nightmares that wake her from sleep. She's having difficulty going to school because uh, she uh, tends to provoke flashbacks to uh, the nightmares of her house getting burned down. Uh, what is your differential diagnosis for this presentation? Thank you, Kara. Acute stress disorder, PTSD, right. So turns out uh, that mental health and climate change are quite uh, tied together. Um, this is a picture of uh, Paradise, California, where the campfire more or less burned the town to the ground. This was the most deadly uh, wildfire in California history some years ago. Uh, yes, I hear you cry. You live in southwestern Pennsylvania and uh, you don't have wildfires, uh, except unfortunately you do. Um, this is a, a satellite image of smoke in the air from fires uh, in July of 2021. Um, I wasn't in Pittsburgh at the time, but um, these wildfires actually created air quality hazards in Boston. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean if you see these um, plumes of smoke from space, which is what you're seeing here, that they reach ground level. In fact, in many cases, they're they're uh, generally don't cause much in the uh, decrement in air quality. But in this case, in many parts of the Eastern United States, they do. But here's the kicker, folks. And this is why understanding how climate change is altering weather patterns and extreme events is so important to healthcare providers. Uh, wildfires don't just happen in the Western United States. They happen in Eastern Canada, which is this maps on the right. And it is the Eastern Canadian wildfires that have posed the most routine and regular uh, threats to air quality. Uh, and so as the climate warms, the prospects of fire moving further east across Canada is growing. Uh, and those fires in particular have great relevance to folks, not just uh, where you are, but across uh, the eastern, northeastern third of the United States. Uh, wildfire smoke is filled with all kinds of nasty stuff. Um, there are a bunch of uh, toxic substances, but the one that we think most about is something called particulate matter, um, labeled PM 2.5 on this slide. Um, the 2.5 refers to the diameter of the particle suspended in the air. Uh, 2.5 microns is about 1 20th the width of a human hair. Uh, recent studies have found in children that exposure to particles um, created by burning stuff in wildfires are more toxic uh, than the background uh, particles that are in the air from other sources. For most children in the United States, those sources are fossil fuels. Um, and we'll talk more about that in a moment. But um, the effects of wildfire smoke on air quality have been so profound in the northwestern part of our country that the air quality progress that has been achieved in the last 40 years, uh, thanks to the Clean Air Act, has been reversed. Uh, there's been so much wildfire smoke and so intense and so pr uh, prolonged uh, that air quality has started going in the wrong direction. Uh, particulate matter has a whole suite of uh, effects on health. Um, in older adults, uh, we know that something on the order of a few hundred thousand people are dying a year in the United States from particulate matter that is produced simply from burning fossil fuels, gas, coal, uh, and oil. Um, but we also have evidence that suggests that particulate matter exposure is, is associated with infant death. Uh, it's certainly is strongly associated with uh, adverse pregnancy outcomes, premature birth, uh, low birth weight. Um, and uh, it is causative of asthma as well as uh, contributes to asthma exacerbations. Um, so uh, there are a suite of health outcomes uh, that associate with particulate matter. Interestingly, I should point out that um, respiratory 
uh, in ear infections associated with particulate matter. Uh, and that uh, particularly when it comes to things like COVID or the seasonal flu or even RSV, um, exposure to particulate matter, um, particularly early in life, can impair lung development. Uh, those children are likely to suffer more with uh, these viral respiratory infections because their lung capacities are lower. Um, and then, of course, if you're asthmatic, you're exposed to particulate matter and have an illness like RSV or flu, um, uh, your ability to cope is, is arguably worse. So uh, wildfires are a growing challenge uh, across the United States and around the world. Um, climate skeptics often, when I make this point, say yes, but the global amount of wildfire has been going down. And if you were to Google that right now, you would say, you would see this, that the global trend in overall wildfires going down. Um, that's because most of the historical wildfires uh, occurred in the African savanna, and those wildfires aren't happening, folks, because we've cleared all the vegetation, so there's nothing to burn. But when you look at places like California or certainly Canada or other parts of the world uh, where the vegetation has not been cleared by human activities, rates of wildfires are very much going uh, the wrong direction. Uh, wildfire season is longer because spring is starting earlier and uh, winters are starting later. Uh, and so the prospect of having a wildfire smoke around for more parts of the year is, is growing as well. Okay, um, next case, and I promise this is the last case of the difficult news before I get to the good news, um, but it is important to realize how clearly climate change matters to the health and welfare of children. So this one, eight-year-old boy, history of aggression and autism, takes several meds, including quetiapine and cogentin. Uh, psychiatrist increased the quetiapine past week. Um, you're seeing him for an urgent visit because he's been acting confused after playing outside for a few hours. He complains of a headache and nausea. Um, he's febrile. Um, he appears flush. His skin is diffusely red and dry. And when asked what he was doing outside, he said he had a great time dancing with wildcats. What's this child's uh, diagnosis? Heat stroke, thank you, Noel. Good. So heat stroke, the altered mental status, the hot uh, skin, red skin, are hallmarks of heat stroke and of course the fact that he's febrile. Any other thoughts about what's going on with this child? Great, thank you, Rachel. So he's on a boatload of anticholinergic meds, um, which um, as some of you may remember the mnemonic, you know, mad as a hatter, dry as a bone, um, so no sweating, uh, fevers. Um, so this child is, is a really good example of the intersection of the warming we're seeing with our greater use of certain medications that actually have been shown to increase risk of adverse outcomes with heat exposure, uh, particularly in adults. Um, we have yet to have uh, good research on this in children, but uh, given what we know, um, this is an emerging risk to everyone's health um, as we see more heat waves. Uh, to be clear, uh, it's already getting warmer. So um, these are the changes in average temperature from the um, 19, early, 19, early 20th century to 2012. Uh, and you can see uh, many parts of the country, and particularly northern parts, have warmed more, um, almost two to three degrees in some places. Um, that average warming may not seem like much, but um, it actually creates a substantial increase in temperature extremes. So days where the temperatures are just off the charts. Um, some of you remember the, may remember the Pacific heat dome in the Northwest a couple summers ago where temperatures in Portland, Oregon, um, which don't usually get above 90, were well over 100, 110 degrees. Uh, and, and these sorts of extreme events are unprecedented uh, in anyone's experience. Um, bodies have four ways to deal with heat. You can uh, conduct it out by sitting on an ice cube, for instance. You can convect it off through a fan. Uh, you can radiate it out through vasodilation, or you can sweat it out through evaporation. Um, a key point of physiology is that when uh, air temperature exceeds body temperature, the only way to really get heat out is through sweating, which is why drugs like anticholinergics or even SSRIs or a whole host of other medications that affect sweating or, or water homeostasis like a diuretic can be so risky with heat that they impair the body's 
um, most effective means of dissipating heat when it's very hot out. Um, we did a study published earlier this year looking at rates of emergency department uh, emergency department use among children across uh, the FIS cohort, which uh, represents a fair swath of the country, um, and found that not only were heat-related illnesses more likely, uh, but um, a suite of infections, bacterial enteritis, um, but I think there's some really, I think, compelling and, and interesting findings we need to follow up here, uh, including things like um, injury and poisoning. Um, the uh, diabetics weren't so surprising, but interestingly, blood and immune system disorders um, and this is probably uh, my hunch is children with anemia um, were more likely to show up in the emergency department as well. Um, but needless to say, it is very clear that heat is not just about heat stroke folks. Heat is about any child with a chronic illness potentially being at risk by the heat stressing homeostasis and leading to whatever their underlying condition is uh, deteriorating. Uh, there are all kinds of compelling studies showing the profound um, uh, breadth of uh, the profound depth and breadth of heat effects. Um, I mentioned pregnancy outcomes with particulate matter, but heat has also been associated with adverse pregnancy outcomes. Mental health, so um, suicide, particularly we think about older adolescents in this group. Um, there are some dozen, maybe 14 studies now with associations between a 1 to 37% increase of suicide risk per degree of warming. A study by Marshall Burke at Stanford looked across uh, Canada, uh, sorry, Mexico and the United States, um, found that access, and I put a gun here, to lethal firearms, I think more than doubled risk of this effect. So there was a huge uh, bump up in the amplified risk if you have access to lethal means. Uh, medications. So um, there's some really, I think, um, pilot quality studies, but nonetheless showing that um, drugs that are delivered by devices like albuterol don't work well when they're left in extreme heat. Um, similar work has been shown with EpiPens. Um, these are medicines that get carried around with people and you know might get left in a trunk of a car or in a glove compartment. Uh, and lastly, there's uh, much more evidence uh, than there was even a few years ago that heat exposure is a bear and pair our ability to think. Now, um, you all may be in over air conditioned offices and hospitals, but many providers, in fact, work in temperatures that are hotter uh, indoors than is probably good for our ability to think clearly. Uh, and that may have an effect on air rates, a question that remains unstudied, at least in the medical population, but certainly in other populations. Uh, this has been found to be true in, in knowledge workers. And similar to the research done on sleep deprivation and medical errors, where we had to show those same findings in, in providers, which had already been shown in airline pilots and truck drivers and 13 other um, members of our same species. We had to show that in fact, the effect is real in us too, but nonetheless, um, that is also a concern. So that's the last intersection I'm gonna go through, which is not to say that there aren't many other ways in which the increased greenhouse gases depicted on the left of this slide can translate into effects on pretty much any disease you're interested in, whether that's through wildfires, um, ozone exposure, ozone is smog, it gets produced in greater quantities when it's hot out. Uh, power failures have been associated with all kinds of health risks. Uh, and and you, can, you can work your way through this slide. Um, one point I wanna emphasize here is that the final common pathway of all these changes to earth systems on health works through migration. Um, we see more and more, even within the United States, families being displaced because of wildfires, hurricanes, um, coastal flooding, uh, et cetera. Uh, and people, and particularly children, who actually make up the bulk of migrants uh, globally, um, suffer health, uh, adverse health outcomes when, when forced to move. Okay, enough of the tough news. I want to talk about what we need to do about this. Um, and I'm also gonna give you a case uh, to illustrate this point. So this is a 12 year old kid um, with ADHD, um, BMI of 32, insulin resistance, uh, moderate persistent asthma, presents for well child checkup, takes methylphenidate, sertraline, montelukas, fluticasone, silmeterol. He reports he's been short of breath several times a week, trouble walking up stairs, getting short of breath, uh, and avoids going outside. He's getting teased at school because of his weight and has been feeling increasingly down and has had passive suicidal thoughts. What do we do for this child? I was being honest when I said I gave the easiest questions first, but what would be the right responses to try and address the many need, uh, medical needs of this child?
Okay. Decreased his LTRA. It's one option. Good. Other thoughts? Anybody want to deal with his mental health challenges or his insulin resistance, obesity? In fact, he's not going outside. Discuss with family potential social determinants, which may be impacting his ability to get healthy foods and exercise. Good. So there are likely uh, obstacles in the way of those things. Uh, medical home to address many issues of optimal asthma management. So there may be some fragmentation of care issues and weight management. Good. Right. So is this asthma or is it deconditioning or maybe some combination of both? Would PFTs be helpful? Good. Longer appointment with PCP for motivational interviewing, seeing therapist, make sure he has a crisis resource. Good. Getting therapy. Thank you, Anna. So these are all um, answers that um, are completely appropriate um, for what this child's concerns are. And the reality is, is that for children like this, presuming that, you know, he actually is plugged into a good medical home and is receiving therapy, which this child was, our interventions are actually remarkably ineffective. So I would point out that even in the best obesity clinics in our country, we are able to make a difference, but the differences on a population average have not been found to be massive. Uh, the effects of adding more medications to this child asthma regimen uh, are likely not to be hugely effective. Um, uh, he's on appropriate therapy for depression. Uh, he might benefit from a different SSRI, that's possible. But the bottom line is I would argue that um, to one of the responses, our medical ability to actually address this child's problems is actually, in my view, relatively ineffective, especially in contrast to the things we need to do to address climate change. Let me make that point clear. We know that in cities around the United States, there are huge temp temperature differences across the landscape, sometimes in the order of 20 degrees or more, based on where you live. Uh, that temperature difference means in the summer, children are exposed to more heat. Uh, it also means they're exposed to more air pollution. Uh, and we see that as a function of race that goes back to the original uh, federal uh, home loan bank board uh, initiative to provide uh, mortgages to American families that was codified explicitly on the basis of race. Uh, this practice is commonly known today as redlining. Uh, you can see here uh, data from a publication a couple of years ago by Vikram Shandas at uh, Oregon State uh, that showed that regardless of where you are in the country, your race uh, is uh, strongly associated with how much uh, heat you're exposed to, that's the land surface temperature on the left, and inversely proportional to uh, where uh, tree canopy is. Um, so there are profound effects of these exposures to the child's asthma. Uh, there also may be, there's some evidence suggests that green space may be conducive to being outside. Um, but one of the big things that I think is underappreciated in the realm of access to green space, particularly is relevant to this child, is its potential benefits to mental health. Um, I show here the findings of one study. Um, it was a longitudinal, prospective longitudinal cohort study of nearly a million children in Denmark, uh, where these children were followed uh, for uh, incidents of uh, mental health uh, disorder diagnosis. Uh, and in children who grew up in homes uh, and at schools that were around the, that were in the upper quartile of green space exposure, uh, they had half the mental health diagnoses at age 10 as their peers who grew up in the lowest quartile. Uh, this is accounting for um, the variables that are known to uh, explain variability within mental health diagnoses are listed on the bottom of the slide. Uh, many people are very skeptical of this kind of research. Um, I would argue that there are enough studies now and particularly prospective studies like this one to suggest that um, we may not know the magnitude of this effect in detail, um, but it seems increasingly clear that exposure to green space is an independent predictor of child mental health. Uh, and that children who are growing up in these communities without green space that are hotter and more polluted also may be more vulnerable to mental health disorders. 
Another thing that we need to do to address climate change is to build green. Uh, we did a study some years ago looking at the health benefits of the green building movement in the United States. We found huge savings in energy costs, but also uh, huge amounts of asthma attacks prevented. Why? Because green buildings use less electricity. That means burning less fossil fuels. That means less asthma. Uh, and the fossil fuels that get burned typically affect the lowest wealth communities, which are typically communities of color in this country. Um, uh, this is a photograph in the background of a housing development in Philadelphia, which is a, a green affordable housing development. Um, the benefits of green building uh, not only benefit air quality uh, outside, they also benefit air quality indoors. So there are many chemicals that children are exposed to indoors that are endocrine disruptors um, that also um, may be uh, harmful to lung development. But perhaps the biggest effect of green housing in affordable, uh, affordable green housing is what it does to household budgets. Um, about one in five households um, have reduced or given up necessities like food and medicine to pay an energy bill. So we screen for social determinants and often ask about utility and security and try and help families with utility bills. But the reality is that the less well off you are, the more likely you are to pay more for your utilities. Why? Because your homes are the least uh, energy efficient, have the biggest boilers, most leaky, least insulated. 70% um, of low income households are located in areas with extreme surface urban heat. So in the summer, if they have air conditioning, they have to air condition more because it's hotter. So there's a huge injustice here that's compounded by the cost of air conditioning, which of course can be life-saving. Um, you can see the data here about the percentage of um, income uh, that is associated with use of solar. So who's getting access to renewables to produce essentially free electricity in homes? It's people who are already well off. Um, there are programs in most states, and I know in Pennsylvania, that take a portion of ratepayer uh, utility ratepayer funds and put them into a pool to weatherize homes, to give people subsidized solar panels. These programs almost always benefit richest people first. Um, I'm very proud here in Massachusetts, we we're able to actually reverse that. Um, but nonetheless, there's a huge equity barrier uh, that has been created in taking these funds and giving them back to people who may not need them as much as others. Um, so green affordable housing is a huge part of addressing child health needs, either through its effects on indoor air quality, outdoor air quality, effects on housing security, and the known downstream effects of that on healthcare access. We know that children who are housing insecure are much more likely to have a lack of access to a consistent medical home, may use the emergency de uh, department for primary care more, uh, and not have preventative care. Okay. The next thing we need to do to address climate change is to green transportation. Uh, uh, if we gave this child greater access to affordable and reliable public transit uh, and increase the safety of those, uh, increase the safety and convenience of active transit, we might actually do something really good for air quality and uh, weight. Uh, so uh, there's a, a very impressive study that came out of Oakland a few years ago that was able to link um, block by block air quality measurements that were assessed by a roaming car with records from Kaiser Permanente. So we had arguably the most hyperlocal at scale uh, assessment of association between air pollution and asthma uh, that's ever been done. And what was found was that children living in uh, West Oakland, uh, predominantly lower wealth community of color, uh, were much more likely than their peers in the Oakland Hills to have asthma. On average, in the United States, one in five children develops asthma because they're breathing tailpipe exhaust. Um, but in low wealth communities of color like West Oakland, that's maybe half. So if we, and that's because they're living near, in this case, the 880 and the 80, they're being surrounded by you know, heavy traffic, particularly diesel exhaust. Uh, if we get those fuels off the road, uh, these children will do better. This is a great benefit to child health because asthma, as we all know, is a major factor in, in not only child health, but in learning at school and other ability to participate in sports and obesity and the rest. Um, but it's, of course, a win for health equity. Uh, the next thing we need to do for climate is to address access to healthy and nutritious food. Um, we have, as I don't need to tell you, an extraordinary challenge uh, dealing with the unhealthy food environments uh, that our children face. Um, in contrast to that, I wanna call out a store that has opened in Boston by Doug Rouch, who's a former executive at Trader Joe's, who saw all of the warts of our food supply system and designed a grocery store to try and address them. 
Um, Daily Table was started in, a, in, a, in Roxbury, uh, Massachusetts, um, which is a lower wealth uh, community, uh, which is predominantly uh, Black uh, American. And at this store, uh, Doug was able to leverage the nonsensical food labeling laws in the United States. Many of you will have seen packages labeled as used by, sell by, uh, um, best by. Uh, these have no basis in food safety or nutrition. Um, and they create a huge amount of food waste because no one buys them once the label is gone, uh, labels passed. So uh, Doug buys these products nearing their date. Grocers will often put these in the trash well before their date because no one buys anything where the date of expiration is two, three days away. Uh, and he is able to use them to make uh, prepared foods. So you'll see on the left a, a counter here of prepared foods. Um, he buys these for a fraction of the uh, market cost and then is able to prepare these foods and deliver these um, completely nutritious, healthy meals uh, at a fraction of the cost. Um, he also serves produce that isn't uh, that doesn't look like it came out of a museum piece, right? So there's, for, you know, you go to a grocery store, even the change these days, you see produce that all looks like it was crafted by plastic mold, but of course that's not how nature works. So estimates are that maybe a third or half of produce is not used on grocery shelves because People won't buy it because there's a blemish, it's misshapen, it's miscolored, so forth and so on. Um, that food, of course, is perfectly health and safe, uh, healthy, safe to eat. Um, that produce is sold at this store at substantial discounts. Um, but arguably one of the most impressive innovations, I think, in this store is that it has a teaching kitchen, which is not for the adults. The teaching kitchen is for the students in the Boston Public Schools who come into the store, learn about nutrition, but also learn how to prepare meals in a string of events that need to be addressed to improve access to healthy foods at home, we need to acknowledge that most uh, adults who are, or many adults who are low health may not have the time to prepare meals. Uh, they may not have uh, the knowledge of how to prepare these meals. And they certainly don't necessarily have the time to learn uh, these things, but as a part of an educational program, um, their children may, uh, and we've seen progress in this way and in getting healthier foods into diets in homes. Uh, there's now, I think, four of these stores around uh, the Boston area, uh, and I expect uh, it will continue to grow. I should also note that they hire almost exclusively from the local community. Uh, the other issue related to climate that stores like Daily Table address is food waste. Um, it is staggering how much of our food goes into the trash. Globally, if you took all the food that was pitched, uh, it would be the third largest emitter of greenhouse gases because our food folks is produced with fossil fuels. Um, fertilizer, for example, is made with uh, natural gas. On the United States, somewhere between a third and a half of our food gets pitched, um, typically after it's purchased, whether that's at a store, a restaurant. Um, in terms of healthcare, our big crime is our um, group meals. So the lunches or dinners where we have a buffet and huge amounts of food go uneaten. Um, there are protocols that many institutions have put in place that can address food waste in institutions like this. Uh, the last piece I'll mention here is we need to move to renewable cleaner energy. So even today, the vast majority of electricity uh, and energy in the United States comes from fossil fuels. Uh, massive gains have been made in wind and solar in particular, but you can see here that there's still a fraction of the energy that goes into our society. Um, the movement off of fossil fuel internal combustion-based engines and motor vehicles is going to be huge because transportation is the largest and fastest growing part of our energy mix, uh, and it's all fossil fuels. Um, we need to be, bear in mind that electricity has to come from somewhere, and the electricity that will probably source a lot of those electrons is coming most likely from natural gas, given the current lay of the land, but nonetheless, um, those fossil fuel emissions can be eliminated with current technology. Um, Moving off fossil fuels is a health equity move. Um, let me be clear that if you want health equity, you need climate action. Um, climate change is foundationally a problem for child health equity. Um, this is a study from PNAS from a few years ago now, which showed that not only are black Americans uh, the most exposed on a population average to particulate matter, but Hispanic Americans face the greatest disparity, meaning of the particulates that get produced, they are least responsible. So they have this greatest gap between the amount they cause and the amount they're exposed to. And because these emissions of pollutants are most often hitting low wealth communities because that's where the freeways are, that's where the power plants are, uh, the other industrial sources. Um, when we reduce these emissions, we stand to actually create health equity. 
Uh, in the realm of climate change action, we often talk about a just transition off of fossil fuels, uh, which first and foremost means addressing uh, the historical injustice of pollutant burdens from fossil fuels in this country. But it also means not neglecting the reality that is the reason I'm able to talk to you right now is because of fossil fuels and people in our country who have dedicated their lives to mining, processing, transporting uh, fossil fuels. Uh, and uh, those communities often have been uh, economically left behind. Uh, this uh, story from the Washington Post talks about how the closure of coal plants in Ohio has left no economic opportunity and poverty in its wake. And so I think we need to be mindful that as we advocate for moving off fossil fuels, which is, of course, what we need to do, uh, that we cannot stand on firm uh, moral ground or even good, in some cases, economic ground uh, by ignoring the communities that are wholly dependent upon fossil fuels for their livelihoods. To turn inward here in the challenge of tackling climate change, uh, I think it's critical that we look at ourselves. Uh, healthcare is immensely carbon intensive, folks. Hospitals are the second most energy intensive buildings in the United States after food service because food service is dominated by large air conditioned storage facilities. Uh, outpatient health facilities are also pretty health and, uh, carbon intensive. And uh, this slide shows where we have low hanging fruit in the circles on the left. We just have huge amounts of waste, folks. That is uh, a dead weight loss to carbon emissions. Uh, we have huge amounts of preventable disease. In fairness to us, we don't get incentivized very well to prevent disease, although as pediatricians and child health providers, we do a much better job of this than most, but we all know we can do better, especially if we were actually paid to do it. Um, we waste huge amounts of supply chain prescriptions, uh, procedures. These are all both, I think, not good healthcare, but also bad for the environment and children's health through that pathway. When we think about how we need to take action on climate within healthcare, I did mention that our buildings use a lot of energy, but the reality is the bulk of emissions in healthcare come from drugs, pharmaceuticals, and chemicals, and food. Um, there's, of course, a whole suite of other stuff. The scope one emissions are our buildings, the scope two is electricity, which is huge in those buildings. Uh, but it's really the supply chains, uh, particularly pharmacy, uh, where we have huge amounts of emissions. And that's because essentially all of our drugs are made by fossil fuels uh, and their transportation, storage, refrigeration are also all fossil fuels. So these are actions we need to take uh, when it comes to reducing emissions and, and all the health and health equity gains we can get from them. But the truth of the moment is climate change is here uh, and it's affecting us now. And we also need to think about how we can protect children at risk. Um, uh, just a few months ago, uh, Howard Coe, uh, the former Assistant Secretary of Health and Human Services, uh, Kristen Stevens, who's Director of Disaster and Climate Preparedness in AmeriCares, and myself published this piece in JAMA. We talk about defining a paradigm, which is patient-centered climate action and health equity. Uh, in this piece, we talk about how important it is to put the populations most at risk first when we think about how to keep people safe. So what does that mean? Well, here's an example. In places like Pittsburgh, I expect that if there is a heat wave, the city opens cooling centers, may offer free transportation on public transit, may even offer free Lyft or Uber rides to those facilities. That is a completely logical and intelligent response, which has been shown to probably be helpful, but not to the people who are most at risk of dying. Why? Because it turns out the evidence is clear that in heat waves, the people who are most at risk of dying are immobile. Uh, they are socially isolated. They lack air conditioning. Uh, and even without those things, there's evidence that shows that people at risk don't want to go to the cooling center because they don't know anyone there. They've never been there. They don't feel particularly safe. Uh, and they wind up staying at home. So a patient-centered climate uh, resilience plan there would involve conversations and uh, with providers around uh, as someone mentioned in, in, in response to the question, motivational interviewing about, okay, what would you do to keep yourself safe if it was too hot out? Is there a neighbor's house? Is there a park nearby with shade? Uh, is there a church? Uh, what is the viable plan to keep that person safe? Um, just uh, last week, uh, we released a first of its kind toolkit to give providers and patients um, this view of patient-centered climate resilience uh, by climate shock. So we have research for heat, wildfires, and hurricanes. 
there are tip sheets for patients about how to address risks from these things based on particular medical diagnoses. There's information for providers, uh, including disease management plans uh, related to these exposures. Um, and our hope uh, is that these will be a first step to improving resilience for those most at risk. Um, I could have spent an hour talking about this, um, but if you have questions about it, please ask. Uh, the website, these are freely available, uh, is at the bottom. Um, in the coming year, we're gonna be pushing these out more and evaluating them. Um, and, and we fully recognize they are imperfect and, and need a lot of work. Um, but we also realize that particularly on the front lines of healthcare delivery, uh, we know that that's where the rubber hits the road when it comes to risk from these climate shocks. And those clinics have been under-resourced in all kinds of ways. And so we are both working to develop knowledge resources, but also help them tap into funds that have been made available through many of the bills you've heard being passed by Congress around climate. Uh, the last point I'll make, and I think this is a critical one, is around our unique role as healthcare, uh, child health providers in this, on this issue of climate. So the question is, who do people in the United States trust to communicate to them about climate and health? Uh, and if you can't tell, this is a mirror. Um, there have been many studies that have looked at who Americans trust, and overwhelmingly people trust their primary care provider. This is a piece that was well illustrated in the pandemic where you saw this gradient of trust that was strongest at the, um, as difficult as it was for us to deal with all the um, mis and disinformation around coronavirus. At a average level, people trusted the providers closest to them for better or worse. Uh, that is true with climate. Um, we have found that in the national sample of the United States, that people who are on the fence, I'm not talking about people who are climate deniers, um, are most compelled to do more around climate when they understand how it matters to their health, the health of their children, and particularly the actions we can take that matter now, like the ones I talked about. There are resources for providers who have, uh, that, that essentially give a playbook. Uh, many of them come from Eco America, um, one of which is illustrated here. Uh, and, uh, you know, this isn't for everybody for sure, but one of the things that's clear is for a problem that has been described as existential for humanity, we don't talk about it all that much. Um, this is study, uh, this is data that comes out of the Yale uh, program on climate communication. Uh, and it's a national map of how often people talk, adults talk occasionally about climate change. The national average is somewhere uh, in the 30s. So Allegheny County is actually doing better than average, but fewer than half of adults in Allegheny County would say that they talk about this issue occasionally. So um, there are ways to talk about this, not even with your patients, but in communities uh, and, and you know whether it's talking to policymakers um, in Ohio, your neighboring state, the health community was incredibly influential in dealing with renewable energy portfolios. Massachusetts incredibly valuable to our climate bill. Um, and, and I think providers tend to underestimate their influence uh, particularly when we talk about how it matters, climate and, and, and fossil fuels matter to the health of the people we care for and to our ability to do our jobs, uh, how that influences policymakers' understanding of why certain actions are important. With that, I'll leave you with a newsletter that our center puts out um, called The Climate Optimist. Oop, skip that last slide. Uh, the Climate Optimist is a monthly newsletter that provides the good news on climate, um, the media, as we all know, loves bad news, and there is plenty of it with climate change, but it also obscures a broader reality that there's a tremendous amount of good news. Uh, this year, we've seen unprecedented investments from our government in climate action uh, as just one uh, example, um, but we really believe that um, the more we can understand how much we stand to gain when it comes to climate action for our children, for uh, health equity, it's going to make it more and more tempting to do more uh, when, it, when it comes to addressing climate change. So with that, I will stop. Um, gladly take questions.